particular uh, galaxy of our well wishers uh, to join the release of the book. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our journey in the space of family business uh, and the relevance of this book. I joined ILB on day one as a founding faculty in 2001 and soon noticed that no academic institution in India was uh, championing the cause of family business in India. Although family business is the most uh, significant, most important segment of ownership in the country, not only in India, but uh, elsewhere also. Uh, in terms of control and management, family businesses play a very, very dominant role. Okay. Unfortunately, most of them do not survive uh, beyond two or three generations. We were wondering as to why. We wanted to find out the reasons and help stop this trend. So 2003, the ISB started. I was uh, fortunate to work with uh, none, none other than Professor John Ward. He is a pioneer. He is a guru of uh, the field of family business. Uh, Professor Ward uh, came from the Kellogg School of Management, and I joined for ISB. We started a training program for honor managers of uh, family business. And then I became increasingly active. In fact, uh, Professor Ward mentioned that I was more like fish to water. I was passionate, I got involved in family businesses straight away. And then we started uh, expanding our activities, but recognizing our ISB's reputation and potential to contribute to this space. Uh, Dr. Thomas Mitani established the chair of family business and wealth management at ISB in 2000. I, I was fortunate. I was fortunate to be appointed as the, the first chair professor to hold this responsibility. I was very fortunate. I was very happy. Um, from the very beginning, we were focused on contributing to the creation of knowledge as well as the dissemination because our focus was on both theory and practice. So the, therefore, we wanted to be a catalyst and a change agent for perpetuating the stewardship role of uh, business family, especially from India and other emerging markets, uh, by creating and disseminating world-class knowledge and providing reliable and attractive platform for sharing the data. In the next few years, we undertook various activities, including the very famous, very uh, uh, say, reputed, Asian Invitational Conference of Family Business. We started in 2008. Uh, I continue to lead research, training, case writing, and also interacting with the media very intensely because we wanted to benefit the stakeholders in the community. Uh, thanks largely to our efforts uh, to create awareness and possibilities of building lasting family businesses. In 2013, ISB launched the first uh, first graduate program meant for children of fam business families, which is called the PGP MFAM. Okay, that's a very successful program which is going on now. Around that time, Dr. Spalti conveyed to me their happiness with what we were doing and promised further funding to upgrade the activity. In 2015, the Thomas Mitani Center for Family Enterprise was inaugurated and which helped us to grow further, both in terms of depth and breadth. Our current portfolio is very large. Uh, we do a lot of research, training, teaching, biannual conference, outreach activities, workshops, publications, and a variety of them. So the journey so far has been greatly uh, exciting and immensely enriching. This is all made possible because of a support, involvement, passionate involvement of a small team. We have a small team. We are most grateful to all the support and encouragement received from Dr. Shmitani, Dr. Spalchi, Dr. Rusha from their team, and the present and past deans of ISB and my colleagues. And besides, uh, it, this would not have been possible without the warm support we received from the business fraternity in India and outside. 
In one of my regular conversations a couple of years back, uh, Dr. Stalti asked me to consider preparing a synthesized record of what we have been doing in the past several years. He said, you are creating legacy. The idea germinated in my mind. And now I have the book, Lasting Legacies, Championing Indian Family Business School. As I have mentioned in this book, and uh, I quote, institution building is a journey that encompasses the cumulative legacy contribution of many students over long periods of time. ISB's Thomas Schmitani Center for Family Enterprise is on a mission to make monumental contribution to the field of family business, both by knowledge creation and its dissemination among various stakeholders. This is a long voyage and that, that we have embarked on with passion and clear vision. Let me also add at this point that individuals are dispensable and great institutions require leaders always. I believe that it is the duty of a responsible leader to hand over the mantle to a worthy person who can take the institution to greater heights. So therefore, I have decided to step down from this position and hand over the baton to Professor Saugada Ray in the next few months. With this, uh, let me uh, now request uh, Dr. Thomas Mitani to say a few words on this occasion. Very briefly, I will not take much time uh, to introduce Dr. Mitani. He is the chairman and founder of uh, his family office, Spectrum Value Management Limited. Dr. Shmitani led Holsim Limited, uh, which is controlled by, uh, for many years by his family, and, uh, and he built it up as the largest building materials company. And subsequently, uh, he was made the Emeritus Chairman of uh, Lafarge Holsim. Lafarge and Holsim got merged a few years back. Besides being one of the largest and wealthiest industrialists in Switzerland, Dr. Shmitani is one of the best known philanthropists with varied interests, including uh, education and art. May I request uh, Dr. Shmitani to share his thoughts on this occasion? Okay, you, you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Hahn. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the center, now I'm very pleased to attend the launch of the legacy book of the Thomas Schmidlein Center for Family Enterprise at the ISB. I launched uh, my chair in December 2006 and subsequently upgraded it in 2015 to a center and uh, made more funding resources available. When I decided in 2006 to support the creation of uh, our center, the Chair for uh, Family Business and Wealth Management, I had two objectives. The first one, I wanted to help Indian business families understand the best practices in family governance and professionalization and help them sustain and grow the businesses in many ways. And the second objective I was that I was in the process of directing some of my investments into India, both commercial and philanthropic, and personally through my equity stake in Holcim. Holcim started to build up positions in ACC and Ambuja Cement, uh, two icons in the Indian cement industry. The vision and mission of the Thomas Schmidlein Center for Family Enterprise at ISP blend very well in with my personal philosophies and values. Lifelong learning is one of the pillars of my family's value system. Therefore, supporting an education stronghold like ISP fits very well with my family's value system. And I'm convinced that education is the most powerful and most sustainable way to help people to engage themselves and have a positive impact on society at large. Education can never again be taken away from a person. It is probably the best spent time and money. 
One of the key factors for success in education is people. And without the trustworthy and capable partner organization like ISB, you will not be able to reach your objectives. And the center has been a path maker for family business in India. Under Professor Ram's leadership, the Pioneer Center has moved up the ladder step by step, contributing much in the field of research and teaching in India. My relation with the school and the center has been excellent, and I'm very happy with the ongoing engagement. I have always believed in social responsibility of business and how it can shape the lives of people and our environment. As a CEO and chairman of Holcim, I have advocated the principle of the triple bottom line, which means the social and environmental and financial, today one would call it ESG, and that would by all our activities. My interest in the center is an extension of this mission. The idea of the legacy book was to chronicle the work of the years and that the history of family business studies, research and thought leadership at ISB. The timing of the launch is perfect with the transition now from the leadership of Professor Ram to Professor Sulata Ray, but also on the Dean's level from Dean Raj to Dean Matt Bildutla. I can assure you that I will continue to support the new Dean Maran and our new leader of the center, Professor Sugata. I wish the center the very best to make continued impact on the multiple stakeholder of the family business. With this, I would like to close. Thank you for your attention. And I'm look very much looking forward to coming to Hyderabad as soon as possible again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shmitani, for the kind words of appreciation and encouragement. Uh, may I now request uh, uh, our Dean, Professor Rajendra Srivastava, to share his thoughts. Uh, very briefly about him, he is a Dean and Novartis Professor of Marketing and uh, Marketing Strategy and Innovation. He has led the school to rapid growth in the past five years and financial independence. Uh, he has over 30 years plus uh, excellent academic experience. One of the most respected uh, scholars in marketing. He is best known for his work on business model innovation in recent times. Over to you, Raj. Thank you, Ram, and good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be engaged in the launch of the legacy book on the history of family business. Uh, to be followed also by the panel discussion. Um, and uh, ISP's association with Dr. Thomas Medaini has blossomed over the years. Uh, and uh, what started as a chair in family business and wealth management has now become a globally reputed Thomas Medaini Center for Family Enterprise. I would like to congratulate uh, Ram and the team and Professor Sagata Ray to be managed to have managed uh, this transition. Uh, research centers and institutes at ISP have a prominent role in achieving one of the most objectives, most important objectives for ISP, namely thought leadership by combining theory and practice. It is only appropriate that when ISP is commemorating its 20th year, the center has brought out a, a book uh, uh, on the journey that the center has had, you know, uh, on, in family business. It's also interesting that this is, uh, while it's ISB's 20th year, it is also Professor Kaval Ramachandran's 20th year at ISB. I don't know the exact number, but I believe, Kaval, you were employee number three or something like that at ISB, so you've been, you know, with us for the entire journey. The center has a very capable and a dedicated team, and especially in the last uh, few years, uh, we've been uh, really uh, turning out uh, you know, insights uh, that are relevant. The center also supports the uh, postgraduate program uh, in, in family business, and that's already recognized as the best family business management program in India. And uh, it uh, also has the potential to be 
a leading pro and, and I think it already is a leading program globally, but uh, it's a shining light uh, out of ISP, the, the MFAP program. Um, the center has clearly had a strategy of uh, blending, uh, you know, theory and practice, but it's now important to take stock and re-strategize how we will, how we will be moving forward. And um, for both the economy in India as well as uh, family business, uh, which uh, may need to adapt to the changes that are taking place uh, in the environment, uh, both the uh, social environment, the political environment, the economic environment. Uh, I will be stepping down as, uh, as Dean, as uh, Ram, uh, Professor Ram indicated, but I will be spending more time at the Center for Innovation and working you know, from the Center of Innovation uh, with the Thomas Schmittany Center to look at how do we integrate uh, both um, uh, integrate uh, innovation uh, with, with governance in the, in the family business space. So looking forward to a joint venture between the Center for Innovation and, and the Thomas Schmittany Center. I'm also looking forward to supporting uh, Professor Sagata Ray as he takes over, and uh, he's, he's going to, this is a, the center represents a wonderful opportunity. So uh, Professor Sagata, this is, a, is, is going to be something that you will be steering. And uh, it is also a pleasure today to see Mr. Adi Godridge and uh, Mr. Thomas Mitaini uh, to be at the, as panelists in this uh, program. And uh, um, I look forward to seeing how much more the center can do. It's already done a lot. And uh, let's, uh, let's see how else the center can support the growth of family business enterprises in the country and globally. And over, over to you, Ram. Uh, you know, back to you, Ram. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, now, I would request uh, Dr. Dita Salty to say a few words. Uh, Dieter is the co-founder of Spectrum Value Management Limited and has been the CEO since beginning, uh, till recently, but he continues to be the vice chairman of Spectrum Value Management Limited. He's also the vice chairman of uh, Lafarge Holton globally. Uh, he has a very illustrious career that included the stint with the Bank of New York and McKinsey as partner. He has uh, done, interestingly, a PhD in law before he turned to finance. PhD in law from University of Zurich. Uh, over to you, Dita. Thank you, Professor Ram, dear friends of our Thomas schmidt Center at ISP. About two years ago, I approached Professor Ram with the idea of summarizing our activities and achievements of the chair and the center in a book. The timing of the launch was planned earlier, but COVID prevented it several times. Now, I think it's a perfect moment for the launch, also in light of the upcoming handover from Professor Ron to Professor Sugato. I have been very fortunate to play a key role in this journey since the beginning. The idea of the center goes back to 2004, 2005, and Thomas Schmidheine recommended to me to take some educational sessions in the US. However, having worked many years in McKinsey and other institutions in a more US-centric environment, I turned my attention to India and ISB. I conducted a few lectures and attended some educational sessions and interacted with several business leaders. I realized not only that family businesses play a very critical role in the Indian economy, but also that no academic institution in India did anything significant in this space. So I came back to Thomas with the idea of doing something philanthropic in family business at ISP. The dean at that time, Dean Rowe, supported us very well in tailoring a family business program under the leadership of a faculty. 
After an intensive search and evaluation process with the help of Professor John Ward, we recommended the school to appoint Professor Rahm as its leader of the chair. Over the years, the center has become a model institution in India and Asia that advances real world at the economic knowledge of family business by bringing together faculty and practitioners from India and overseas. Particularly noteworthy, as mentioned by Professor Ram, has been the seven Asian invitational conferences, which I have had the opportunity to attend and participate in. At these conferences, I found that the quality of the speakers, attendance, and the level of discussion world class. I also enjoyed meeting many of the leading Indian family business leaders and exchanging notes and ideas with them. European and Indian family businesses share many common traits and trends. One of the main reasons for the success of the center has been its leadership on the Professor Ram, but also the excellent team he has attracted. People like Nupur, Sushma, Nafni, and many others. The center's strategy for growth and its multi-branched approach is very appropriate to the current needs of knowledge dissemination on family businesses. Its wide range of activities from training, teaching, research, case study development, participation in the media, and a host of knowledge sharing activities have made it one of the best institution of its kind, not only in India, but also across the Asian region. Our association with the center and the school has been nothing short of a very satisfying journey for all of us at Spectrum Value Management. We very much look forward to a long and close partnership over the coming years to make our center one of the best go-to places in the world. I wish the center and its team the, all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Dieter, uh, for the very, very encouraging words uh, and appreciation and support. Uh, now, uh, may I request uh, Professor Madan Tilutla to share his thoughts? Professor uh, Madan Tilutla is uh, the Professor of Organizational Behavior at London Business School. He is one of the best known global gurus on strategic negotiations with both uh, scholarly and practical wisdom. Uh, he is one of the best academic leaders around. Uh, ISD is fortunate to have uh, Pro Professor Pilutla as its dean from July 1st, uh, 2021. Over to you, Madan. Thank you, Ram. Um, you can hear me? Clear? Yes. Very well. So let me begin by uh, uh, offering my congratulations uh, to you, Ram, uh, and the Thomas uh, Schmidt Heine Center on the publication of the book. Uh, the book uh, documents all the wonderful things uh, that, uh, that uh, Ram, you personally, uh, but also the team at uh, the Thomas uh, Schmidt Heine Center uh, for Family Enterprise have achieved over the last uh, uh, decade, a little over a decade. Yeah. Uh, the center has, uh, has delivered and it, it continues to uh, make a huge contribution uh, to the scientific understanding of family businesses. Uh, through the creation of cases, which are again, all of those documented in the book, the dissemination of research, which uh, you've seen through conferences, through academic conferences, through white papers and through books and book chapters, and training programs, which as, Ra as Ram has pointed out, has morphed into one of the best uh, family business uh, programs in the country, and possibly we, uh, we have, and this is up to you, uh, Sogata, it's going to become one of the best in the world. So what, what you've done and what you've demonstrated is uh, that, uh, that this kind of uh, research-led education program is possible, it can be popular, and it can be really, really effective. So you've provided a stellar example for the school and for the rest of the country about what a program of research, what it should lead up to uh, through the development of a lot of the practical things that, that you're taking. 
Ram, uh, the legacy that you've uh, you've established here is an outstanding one. Um, I'm sure it will last, uh, which is probably the reason why you're calling your book also Lasting Legacies. By documenting these achievements in the book, Ram has provided the incoming uh, executive director, Professor Sogata Ray, with the inspiration, but more importantly, with the challenge to sustain the excellence that they have managed to, to do up to now. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Schmidt Heine uh, for your visionary support uh, of this program. Maybe you thought this is what it was going to be uh, 14 years ago. Uh, I am confident that, uh, that uh, Ram and his team have delivered on, uh, on the promises that they have made to you. And I hope that it has been consistent with the vision that, uh, that you have outlined for the, for the program. Your generosity has allowed for the development of a program that has been an excellent resource for the for ISB for sure, but also for India. So thank you very much. And I'm grateful when you said that you would like to continue to support uh, the development of the excellence that has already been uh, in place. Thank you also for all the other distinguished uh, people that I see here from family businesses. Uh, I think it's your continued support that has led to uh, the success of, uh, of the center. Accomplishments like this one are always a team effort. You know, always we say it takes a village to build something like this. So thank you for your support. And I hope uh, that, uh, that me in my capacity when I come in and Professor Sogata Ray uh, will continue to have your support as we build on the legacy that, uh, that Ram has left, left behind. Congratulations again, Ram. Uh, welcome on board, Sogata. And thank you for your support, uh, Dr. Schmidt Heine. Thank you, Madan, for the generous appreciation. And uh, we continue to be together. Uh, we will together build the center under the new leadership of uh, Saugadai and you at the school level. Look forward to being a part of that journey. OK. And now, uh, may I request uh, uh, Mr. Adi Godrej uh, to uh, release the book. Very briefly, I will introduce that. Uh, uh, Mr. Godrej doesn't need any introduction, but uh, uh, very briefly, I would say that uh, he was recognized for his uh, contribution, uh, multi-level uh, contribution by award of awarding Patma Bhush and by the government of India, by the president of India. Uh, he is, as I mentioned earlier, he is the chairman of the 124 years old diversified business group, which he led. Uh, in terms of transformation and growth to become a very, very large family business group, over 30, 35,000 crores turnover or over uh, 4 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, one of the most respected industrialist uh, leaders in India and outside. And also he is a great philanthropist. And uh, he conceived, he joined the initial team to recognize the significance of having ISB as an institution. And he has been associated, led the team from the very beginning. And he was uh, past chairman of the, the Board of Governors of uh, uh, ISB. May I now request uh, Mr. Godrej to release the book and uh, others on the uh, panel to join him in terms of the release of the book. So Godrej, uh, if you could. Uh, so, I mean, unfortunately, we are in a virtual mode. So, what we can do is to show the, the book to the audience. You have muted. You have muted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godre. Thank you, other friends uh, and support uh, everybody for re releasing this book. Uh, thank you, Adi, for the release of the book. And thank you, others, for joining this wonderful occasion. So may I now request uh, Mr. Godre to share his thoughts on this occasion. You are muted, uh, Mr. Godre. Am I unmuted now? 
Yeah. Right. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the whole team on the excellent performance of the Thomas Schmidtheiny Center for Business Improvement and the excellent support Dr. Schmidtheiny has provided the Indian School of Business in the field of family business. And I'm sure the ISB will take this to even greater heights in terms of time to come. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Dieter Spelti on his contribution over the years. I have been associated with this center for quite a few years and I've attended several seminars at the ISB and look forward to it contributing to India's family business future in a major way. And I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Shaukata Ray and wish him all the very best. And I'd like to particularly thank Ram for all his contribution and over the years guiding the center in a tremendous manner. And I'd wish him all the best. Dr. Schmidtheiny, thank you for all your support. And we hope to see your continued support of this organization over the years. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Godridge, for your appreciation and uh, very, very warm encouragement, encouraging words. We get inspired. I remember the very many uh, conference keynote speeches you have made on governance, particularly, and the way you have led the building up of the Godridge Group, as well as the governance uh, within the country at the corporate level. So thank you very much. We look forward to your continued uh, uh, support in the years to come. So with that, we are coming to a closure to this uh, part of the evening, uh, the release of the book. So thank you all the speakers. Thank you all for, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Smithani. Thank you, Dieter. Uh, thank you, Raj. Thank you, Madan. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Godridge, for joining this, uh, uh, this program at this uh, point. So thank you very much. And now I would uh, like to move to the next part of this uh, evening, which is also very, very interesting. Uh, we are going to have a, a panel, a eminent panel, experts panel discussion on the future of family business. We chose this theme primarily because the family businesses are undergoing tremendous uh, changes, uh, both internally as well as externally. Externally, it is driven, accelerated by the the, uh, the uh, disruption, technology disruption, political changes, plus the COVID. There are plenty of changes. I mean, very many changes are happening on external front. Internally, families are undergoing rapid changes from joint family system to nuclear family system to uh, single business to family businesses are becoming family of entrepreneurs. So very many changes are happening both on the uh, internal front as well as the external. So we thought that it would be wonderful to get the perspectives of three eminent experts, thinkers in this world, in this field. Okay, we could not have expected the best of them to join us together for this uh, panel discussion. So let me introduce them. Uh, Ms. Meher Padamji, 
She is the chairperson of Thermax Limited, which is primarily into energy business. Uh, she is uh, she's a MSc in uh, chemical engineering from the reputed Imperial College in London, and then worked uh, in different capacities within the Thermax uh, group. Besides that, she is very passionate about sustainability. She has led the transformation of Thermax into a very sustainable and environmental friendly business. We have just completed a case study on Thermax that is being that has been just published. Okay, she is also a philanthropist and musician as well. And I hope there will be an occasion to listen to your musical uh, capability. So we have uh, Mr. Farad Forbes. Uh, he's a co-chairman of uh, Forbes Marshall, which is uh, into steam engineering and uh, energy control plus process automation. He's a uh, MS from Stanford University and uh, built the Forbes Marshall with his uh, father, brother, and the other family members. Uh, he's the chairman of the Family Business Network International, and he has been recently re-elected as the FBN. Uh, chairman, which is a reflection of his commitment and contribution to the field of family business globally. Because uh, FBN International is the largest, largest global network of family business. He's also a past chairman of uh, EII. The third panel speaker expert for us is uh, Mr. Puneet Dalmia. He is the managing director of Dalmia Bharat Group. And he is uh, the force behind the exponential growth of uh, the, uh, the uh, Dalmia Harris Group. He's also founded team and trustee of Ashoka University. He, in fact, took the lead in terms of strengthening the governance mechanisms within his family and building it together. So all three of them have a very rich profile and I don't have the time to get into the details of it, but they have their thinking business. So we thought that we will have all of them together to share their thoughts and who else other than Professor Sogata Ray to lead the discussion, to moderate and lead the discussion. Uh, professor Sogata Ray is a professor of entrepreneurship, uh, family business and strategy at ISD. He has a very rich experience. He is a as a doctorate from uh, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, with uh, long years of experience at the uh, Institute of Management, Indoor, and then later at uh, Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata. He has done a lot of work on uh, business groups. Besides that, he has been associated with the center as a senior advisor, and I always uh, go to him for any input, any advice whenever I need to take any uh, input to try. And he is uh, the executive director designate. I'm very, very happy to pass over the baton to him in the next uh, few months time. With that, let me pass the, uh, uh, the, uh, the responsibilities to Saugada to lead the discussion on of the, of the future of family business. Over to you, Saugada. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Professor Ram and all other speakers who had shown such uh, affection and also encouraging words and, and the promise of support to take the legacy and the grow the legacy of Professor, left by Professor Ram. Because the team and I have the special, I would say, responsibility to, to not only just protect the legacy, but the, like any other family institutions, you're supposed to grow that legacy and make it much, much better than what is today. So uh, it's also, uh, thank you, Professor Ram, for the nice introduction that you provided to this topic and also to oppor opportunity to moderate this panel discussion with very, very distinguished family business leaders of not only contemporary India, but the world. And uh, uh, my job is um, quite kind of simple, just to in initiate a few thoughts and then I think these three speakers, I'm, I'm sure, will take elevate this entire discussion to a different level. We are passing through an interesting time. While a pandemic is raging the world, has been raging the world for the last 17, 18 months, disrupting everyone's life, 
many many lives have been lost many many more livelihoods have been lost in this period but very interestingly on the other hand the sensex the moodometer of stock market is soaring many companies booking record profits inflow of foreign direct investments and foreign institutional investment and the forex reserves are all time high and india in the, the last one and a half years has given birth to more number of unicorns and startups that it had done ever before so sounds very paradoxical and maybe it's paradoxical but why the investors and the wealth creators of the world taking a different and a very clearly optimistic view of about india's future and particularly india's business future in this pan- post pandemic world that's an interesting question by itself to be dealt can be dealt with but for for the day that that is not what the topic is that is a backdrop and what is important for us for today's conversation to take a note that despite the short term shocks suffered by indian economy and businesses the medium and long term prospects of india and some parts of south asia are very bright and are poised to occupy the center stage of global economic progress in the coming decades having that giving that background the context we all know that historically family businesses in india played a preeminent role in the progress of india's industrial and services economy and contrary to popular perceptions our research actually demonstrated that a series of white paper white papers that we have come up with the share of contribution of family businesses in india has been growing steadily in the recent decades so therefore to start with my question to farad fast and then mayer and punit to join in in that conversation being the most dominant contributors to indian economy so far what role family businesses are likely to play in this emerging future which is likely to be even brighter for indian economy so that would be so is that the family business will continue to unleash its entrepreneurial energy and step up and sustain the dominance that it has done for a century or it will concede space to this new age entrepreneurial firms and also many of the global mnc's that are entering as you also know that fdi is the at the highest in this year, year and the previous year so given that that what do you think will be the the role of the family businesses in the future so farad i will invite you first and then i'll request mayer and punit to join in uh, thank you sagatha um i think in in response to businesses all over the world and if you look at um even in the us you know in the united states where you have all the large tech companies and you have the growth of silicon valley uh, firms in in the economy there um you still have very successful family businesses which exist and if you look at the collective uh, contribution that they make to the economy even in a country like the Un- united states it's very significant if you go to europe it's even more so um so if you uh, i think i think globally about 2/3 of all companies um are actually family owned firms uh, they employ about 60% of the global workforce and they contribute around 70% of global gdp now if you come to india as well um i think you would know the statistics better but i think the contribution is probably equally so if not more so what is it that sustains family businesses and what really keeps family businesses growing and it it really is a spirit of entrepreneurship and that spirit of entrepreneurship really comes primarily from the next generation the next generation entering the business at whatever stage of generational transition it is 
So I think we can be quite confident that our family businesses in India have an adequate number of next generation members who will take their family businesses to the next level. There are a number of ways they can do it. Um, there are many more opportunities today for the next generation than when we entered our family businesses. Um, there, are, there are opportunities for starting their own enterprises. Uh, many, many opportunities there which uh, were possibly less in the past. So that's one way. Those enterprises can be in some way related to the family business or it could be something which is independent. But if there is a good way of somehow keeping the connection with the main family business, um, that's a way to actually preserve the link and actually to somehow also renew and transform the legacy business as well. And then of course, working in the business itself, uh, those are opportunities there as well for you know, entrepreneurial uh, activity in terms of doing new things and transforming the business internally as well. So I think there's great opportunity for being, for keeping family businesses as, as a significant force uh, in the economy here as well, despite whatever you know, uh, is happening uh, elsewhere outside family businesses. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Great. I think, um, Farad, what you have just put out, that entrepreneurship, of, thank you for that, uh, that entrepreneurship as the, the key driver for the family actually coming up with every time the challenges have been thrown by the world before the family businesses, that entrepreneurial spirit of the families actually had made that difference. Thank you very much to bring that dimension yeah. But now I have a related question that it is related. You also mentioned about the intergenerational transition that has to happen where the new generation of family leaders have to show the political spirit. But what we normally observe that the intergenerational leadership succession is critical from family business continuity, as you highlighted. We see three distinct types of generation of family members, and each type throws out different kind of challenges for the family leaders. Uh, and first one, I just wanted to, to go to Mehen to ask this question that many next gen members may not be interested or motivated or even capable enough to lead FBs in the future and the kind of futures that are unfolding in today's context with driven by technologies or con sustainability concerns. So Mehen, uh, what do you think uh, would be the to be done by the family leaders to excite, motivate such next-gen youngsters to join family businesses, nurture and groom them to be the next generation leaders. So, uh, and I'm you. saying that because you have gone through that journey uh, yourself and in that position now that why you were saying that, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, just, just adding a little bit to what Farad said, um, if I can just say that, you know, unless a next generation is given space in a family business to come up with their ideas, to come up with their thoughts, uh, to be seen as valued in a family business, um, it, it may not move generation to generation. Um, secondly, I also feel that um, very often the the patriarch uh, doesn't let go and and therefore um have we lost Saugata? <laughs> i think we yeah, lost yeah, yeah. <laughs> may, but may i continue may i continue okay, <laughs> okay. so very often uh, the the patriarch uh, more than the matriarch uh, normally doesn't let go and and uh, and therefore, 
it becomes very difficult then for the next generation to actually take on the legacy and move on. So, um, so I think just coming back to uh, Saukata's question in terms of next gen, how do you groom them? I think the grooming takes place um, almost uh, unconsciously, you know, because um, if you are born in a family business, you are living, breathing a family business day in and day out, uh, whether it's at the dining table, whether it's on holidays, I mean, it's it's throughout, and um, and so I think it's it's how uh, the older generation engages in a conversation with the next generation, how they bring them in. Um, I I remember being taken to the factory at a very very young age, um, just walking around with my parents. I remember. Um, just those dinner table conversations, so many people from our offices used to come home and um, have dinners with my parents. And so I think it's just, it's just almost like a natural osmosis. Having said that, uh, Shabata, you also mentioned that what if somebody is not interested at all, um, not capable? I, I don't know about the capability that can only happen if you actually get your hands dirty. Uh, but if you're really not interested in it um, and not capable, um, I think it's best not to enter the family business. Um, but I think, I think if you have some interest, then I think uh, family businesses can really help to support that interest. Uh, as Farad said, it may be something that they start on their own, which could be either related to what you're doing or something entirely different. It could be in terms of adding to um, the whole philanthropic angle and the CSR angle of the family business. There are so many ways families can contribute to a family business. And I think it's, it's for families to embrace that um, rather than saying this is the only way to do it. Um, so, so that's what I would say. So, so I mean, we, lo we lost you, Sagata. Yeah, it's lost. But I, I joined it at different devices. The connections are quite pathetic. So anyway, I think uh, um, I would uh, like Puneet to add something on this topic, if you have, or, or even the previous question that I asked to Faraz. Yeah. Puneet, I think I need to be in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Shagata. I think um, I first want to just talk a little bit about the future of family business. Uh, uh, I personally, uh, I agree with what uh, Farad said. I think uh, uh, my personal view is the future is very bright. The world has gone through several disruptions over centuries. It was an industrial revolution. If you look at India, there was uh, Britishers leaving India. Again, there was liberalization. Then there was, uh, you know, digital and climate change and now the pandemic. So I think we have seen many disruptions over centuries and the pace of change is only growing. In a fast changing world, you know, as Charles Darwin said, it is not the strongest species that survive, but the most adaptable species that survive. I think family businesses are very adaptable. Uh, I think uh, they have stable shareholders. I think it's a big strength. They are able to take a long term view and hence also have larger ability to take risk. They are not worried about quarterly profits. They are, you know, they have an entrepreneurial DNA, which um, as Meher also said, it's learned on the dinner table or on holidays through a osmosis process. So if you can keep those values alive, I think their ability to survive big shifts in the world is likely to be higher than, um, you know, some of the other companies. Uh, I think, however, their strength is actually their biggest weakness as well. You know, so on one hand, you have stable shareholding and, you know, stable, uh, you know, you know, large shareholders. But if you can't manage egos properly, uh, it can lead to, you know, a big friction. And I think um, uh, the other thing is that there is, you know, they have they have the ability to take a long term view, but this long term view is a big plus, but if you don't have the ability to innovate and if you don't let go, 
again this can be a very very you know uh, you know a big threat as well so i think uh, you know in a fast changing world family businesses have lots of strengths but they have to be mindful of the fact that those strengths can become their biggest weaknesses and i think i just want to share a few examples on how we have dealt with it and you know maybe this is a wider discussion as well i think in terms of egos it is always when there are many human beings working together there are always you know it's possible egos i think you need empathy i think you have to create sensitivity and empathy um you know in in people and we we, teach, we uh, have learned that treating family as a socialist and business as a capitalist you know is one good approach that has worked for us the other thing is in terms of long term outlook and letting go and still fostering innovation i think the what the the mindset and the principle which has worked for us is you have to treat family as professionals so you have to look at what skill sets they bring to the table what are their interests at meher as meher said there are many areas you can contribute you know everybody doesn't have to be a you know ceo some people may contribute in philanthropy some people can contribute in strategy some people can contribute in hr there are many a digital new, for new generation so i think you have to treat the family as a professional and you have to treat the professionals as family members keep them connected you know keep them demonstrate empathy to them you know uh, you know treat them with care and love i think uh, you know those are the principles and guiding factors that have worked for us thank you thank you punit there's a very powerful so pin set up principles that you just outlined i have a very a more direct question on something that you might yourself has experienced and many of the next generation family members are actually facing that that we see that a group of people particularly in the current generation they are not motivated to venture in their uh, in the fam- their own current family businesses but rather than they want to start of their own in sunshine sectors new age technologies digital businesses and you also experienced the similar kind of situation uh, in, uh, several decades ago so i'd like to how does the family deals with such thing the particularly the patriarchs and the family leaders they for them they would like to grow their existing set of things but the new generation wants to do something else farad also mentioned that publicly in the initial comments so i would like you to to see that what do, how do the elders deal with such situation i think first of all uh, my view is you don't have to take anybody for granted you know just because somebody uh, is your son or daughter you know you don't have to take them for granted so just like you attract a professional create a great working environment create a great culture where you know you have a challenging uh you know environment you know you have freedom of expression uh you have empowerment to work i think those are those are important factors and keep it, even though you may build a great culture i think you have to be mindful of the fact that uh, uh you know different generations may have different outlooks in terms of the sectors that they like you know i can clearly say in industrial sectors like we are in it is not easy to attract the next generation uh you know there are, there is a lot of opportunity out there sometimes i wanted to do consulting for some time when i got out of business school and then i was so attracted by startups when i went to silicon valley i wanted to try my hand so i think you have to create space for um, you know uh, multiple pursuits uh, and support support uh, people and i think uh, if we can create you know a good working environment good culture which is empowering which has freedom of expression you have higher chances of attracting people and while you do so you should be mindful of the fact that different people may have different uh, you know ideas and you should encourage multiple persons and that's the that's the spirit of entrepreneurship i mean we have seen you know many groups have pivoted in india as well if you look at many business houses they've gone into new age sectors um you know and sometimes you know uh, the next generation has built built great businesses so i think you have to create just keeping their entrepreneurial dna alive you know space for experimentation and trying new things and entering new sectors okay wonderful thank you so uh, meher uh, farad do you like to add something on this because both of you have experienced yeah. both sides so sure sure um i'd like to just add maybe you know when you when you're looking at um how do you excite and motivate uh, the next gen um i think it goes back to what mayor said initially 
there actually there actually in there are three things i would say you first need to attract the next gen and the way you attract the next gen is by making them to have pride in the legacy so mayor mentioned this that you know when she was you know a child she was taken to the factory she was met people and you you develop that pride in the legacy by seeing what the business stands for what the values of the business are um how the business relates to not only its own industry but also to the community and these are things actually which can create a significant amount of pride in the family legacy the family business legacy and at least in my case and i think in my brother's case and i i can say the same for our children um it's probably what was the primary factor which attracted us to do something with the family business and it's all of us actually both my brother and i and also our two children the second thing is you need to then have a process if the next gen is interested in the business then you need to have a good process of induction and that induction has to be again as both puneet and mayor mentioned you've got to provide space you've got to provide adequate space for the next gen to try things firstly do things which they are passionate about which they have an interest in and find a way to have that connected with the main business with main legacy business give them a project to work on that is aligned to their passion uh but at the same time is connected to the legacy business and i think there's one more thing here as i think you need to start with something which is not so critic super critical that if you were to fail at it um it would not be so significant because it's much easier to fail in a non family environment because you can just move on but in a family business environment for a family member to fail uh, is more difficult and so it is probably a good idea to pick a project which is important but not that critical that you know it would actually sink the business um and then finally you've got to work on figuring out how you can work together because when you have the next generation in the business it's necessary to find a good way that you can work together with you know the senior generation if it's with siblings how do you work together with siblings and that's a story and a, it's a topic in itself but if with good family business education and uh, dr shmidani spoke about it and that's what isb does i mean it trains uh family business uh, uh members from family business families to understand how to work together understand what good family governance is and how the family then relates to the business so that's what i would just add to thank said. you farad i think uh, one particular point that you said which is very counterintuitive and that's why i would like you to reflect a little more on that you said that uh, typically the general belief is that first generation entrepreneurs have the greater burden in uh, cost of uh, entrepreneurship and if they fail they, they is much costlier but you said exactly the opposite you said that actually the burden of um, uh, failure in a family business context is is significant and higher so therefore uh you don't want family members to fail so would you like to elaborate a, a little more on that yeah, because i think i think i think the main thing here is that you know if you have created something and okay you mess something up you know the consequence is well okay i created something but i failed and you know something didn't work out but if you are say third generation fourth generation in a family situation family business situation and if you are the one who creates that failure okay you're carrying that you're carrying a much more significant burden and you don't want to be the one to actually destroy the family legacy 
and this is something we've learned from John Ward in all his uh, teachings, you know, was, was you don't want to be that one. And as a result, then it makes you much more, um, it makes you entrepreneurial, but it makes you also much more prudent in what you decide to do. So you take risks, but you take prudent risks. I think that's the main distinction which which we have uh, in family-owned businesses, as opposed to other businesses where you you don't have that stake in the business, uh, where you might take risks which are not necessarily prudent. Just an amazing insights because it's counterintuitive, but it's amazing insights. I have a more direct question for Meher. Uh, of course, others will also add to that. It is related to, if you look at uh, historically bearing a few exceptions, the traditional business families didn't encourage active participation of women in the family to lead the family businesses. Your family is one such uh, signing exceptions. So, Mayor, uh, how do you see this? Is it changing this in a in the, in the What is the trend that you see in the recent years? Is this trend changing somehow? And if and what needs to be done to more women to participate and lead family businesses in the future? So, um, Shogata, I think, I think uh, first of all, in our case, many women actually come to the helm of a family business by default rather than by design. Um, and uh, I mean, in my, my own, in my own mother's case, okay, um, it is because my father passed away that my mom um, uh, had to take over and lead the organization. Uh, it wasn't planned. There was nothing. Uh, my mom was the head of HR prior to that. Uh, as she was growing up, she was one amongst three siblings, two brothers and herself. Um, it was almost as if the family business was only meant for the two boys. Even though she was much better at her studies, even though she was, uh, she, she just thought that maybe businesses are only for men, you know, because she was never encouraged. Uh, and so uh, I think it was dif very different for me um, because with, with myself, I think my parents decided that both brother and sister would get everything equal. So uh, we were both encouraged to study. We were both given the same opportunities. Unfortunately, my brother passed away. Um, and... Um, but had he been alive, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what would, it, what, what the, the, um, I don't know how it would have been in the family business. Whether because my husband is also in the family business, and so whether we would have sort of let him take over, or whether we would have sort of got our own two little things carved out, I, I'm not sure. I really am not sure. But coming back to your question, I think um, it more and more women are definitely coming into family businesses. I can see that in the next gen, especially. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's excellent um, because I don't, I think women uh, can contribute hugely. And um, I'm seeing that even with my own two children, I've got a boy and I've got a girl. My daughter has studied music technology, nothing to do with, energy and environment um, but still she's interested in learning about the family business and perhaps being a responsible owner of the family business so how do we get her interested in it uh, we're doing exactly what Parad has just uh, uh, outlined um, and because she's not an engineer and because she hasn't studied finance um, how do you bring the organization, which is heavily into engineering, to a person who is a music, uh, a person who understands music. So just, just for, I mean, just, uh, I, I'd love to share about five, six years ago, she showed some interest. And so we, we had a very nice thing organized for her, where we took her to, we asked her, what kind of uh, products do you like using? or do you enjoy eating? So she talked of Lay's chips, she talks of chocolates, she talked of various bits of spaghetti. And so we actually took her to a spaghetti factory. We took her to a Lay's factory 
and showed her how Thermax's products actually produce spaghetti or actually produce chocolate. And that got her very interested in saying, wow, you know, I didn't realize that. So I think there are different ways um, to bring in uh, children, whether boys or girls in this case. But, uh, um, and so I am very hopeful that more and more women will enter family businesses. Um, I think it will take, it will take time especially in India. And I think in, I think more women are also looking to be entrepreneurial. So again, as long as we create space for them in the family business, uh, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Puneet, would you like to add something to that? Because I guess the males have, of the world have to play a bigger role in getting, because in many other sectors, we see that women leaders are emerging and dominating in, in some of the sectors like banking. So we hope in some days that would happen in a family business context also. Would you like to share something on this? No, I think, uh, you know, first of all, if, if you look at the, you know, uh, traditions, I think if you look at, uh, you know, my grandfather's generation, my father's generation, or even in our generation, we see more boys than girls who are a part of family business. And I think... Um, uh, it was probably, I just, you know, if I look at history, it was girls used to get married early. The, you know, stereotype image was that they would be more responsible for family as opposed to giving more time to business. And I think these were the things which were earlier, you know, which guided us. Now, my personal view is that in business to succeed, you know, you need the most important thing is dealing with people. And I think for that, you need empathy. And I personally think you know, uh, while you need drive, you need aggression, I think to build an institution, you need empathy. And I think women have more empathy than men. I don't know how, but it is just, you know, it is just the way, you know, the world is. I mean, there's that motherly instinct. There is, um, uh, you know, uh, they want more harmony. They, they, you know, it's not just not too much disruption. And I think um, they also mitigate risk. I have seen, um, you know, in terms of, um, a lot of families in India, whether it is rich families or poor families, you know, women save. Uh, women are more prudent. Men sometimes, you know, they bet the house. So I think these are very important values, empathy and, you know, uh, prudence, uh, you know, which, which create institution building. So I think they bring a lot of, uh, you know, strong competencies uh, which are required. The, the thing which we need to do a little bit more is we have to start early. Uh, and we have to, you know, uh, educate them, uh, create more awareness. And, uh, you know, that is something which uh, somehow is, you know, not, um, you know, uh, not done in a very systematic and in a very formal manner. I love the examples that Meher shared, um, you know, um, uh, daughter is very creative. You know, how do you get, get her into a, a engineering type business? How do you get her excited? And what a beautiful story she shared. She said, shared. But I think not many people are thinking about it. Otherwise, you say, okay, chalo, iska to interest nahi hai. she's not that much interested. Let me do something else for it. But how do you create a systematic way to involve them, to educate them? I think there's not much which has been done and it has to be done in a more systematic way. But I think they can hugely contribute. And you give an example of banking. Banking is about betting on people. You know, yes, you can look at the balance sheet, but if there's no intention to pay, you know, you can lend all your money and, you know, someday it will never come back. So, you know, their ability to judge risk to bet on people is far, you know, higher, I think, in many ways than men. Of course, Thank men you, Pune. also bring you know, good skills to the table and not, not uh, you know, putting them down. But how can you create the both masculine and feminine energy to work in harmony and to create magic? I think that's something we have to think harder about. And, and, and also, I think uh, what Mayor also indicated that there is a third category of family members who may not join as leaders or executives in the company, but will be an more what you call enlightened, responsible owners. So therefore, how do you create such kind of uh, enlightened, responsible owners? And particularly in that context, what kind of family governance or family or what you call corporate governance and governance mechanisms that you'd like to bring in is something which uh, you uh, anybody, if you, uh, Farad, if you can share some thoughts on that, because both Farad yeah. 
and yeah. mayor of here also mentioned that part that uh, not everybody would have to join think, as an as an executive but you can be an enlightened and responsible owner yeah i think responsible ownership and i think that comes from the concept of you know moving away you know in family business one of the things that we learn you know in family business education is the concept of stewardship that we are we are not really owners but we are here to actually take the business which exists and then pass it on to the next generation hopefully in better shape than we inherited it and that comes not just from managing the business but it also comes from owning the business so you can be a owner and not directly involved in the business now that's where you need to have adequate communication in the family where you are able to work with those family members who are in management and those family members who are just owners of the business um i mean you know one of the things that i've done in fpn is i've had a chance to see a lot of family businesses in other parts of the world which have you know gone through multi generations and when you go through many generations you have many family members who are not involved with the management of the business and they are just there as owners but the ones which are successful are the ones where they have regular dialogue regular uh, through formal structures like family councils if the family is large but if the family is small it can be just regular family meetings and where you have the aspirations of each of the family members um brought out in the open where you can discuss them and where you talk about what their dreams are and what they want to see from the family business uh so as an owner or as a person who's going to be actually managing the day to day affairs of the business or you could be just on the board for that matter uh so there are multiple ways of doing it and there's no right answer you have to figure out your own answer which is right for you uh and your family wonderful i think then that that brings also in another aspect which is, uh, is is in the context that we are seeing that there is an accelerating trend of loosening of the family bondings or family togetherness and there is a sep structural separations of the family happening also from more joint family to nuclear family etc so in that context how do you think that uh, uh, this multi generational uh, legacy transfer and become making more responsible uh, shareholders owners uh, and family leaders will be done what are the some of the special mechanisms that the family businesses are doing on that um i think family business education and what what you do at is be able to you but you what you you know teach uh and within fbn this is one of the main things that we do is that actually we expose uh families to other families and how have they dealt with uh different situations um and i think that's the greatest benefit that you that you actually derive so you know we learn from academics like you uh who are doing the research uh and you know some of the you know thought leadership that comes from people like you um but then you also want to understand the practicalities of how you handle things and and that you learn from people in the room uh others who have gone through similar situations and we personally uh you know not just me but our whole family has benefited immensely from attending various various conferences and uh uh all the john board programs which we had in india with cii and fbn uh so there's been great learning from a lot of that and i'd also Thank say uh, parat sorry i'd also say that um, fbn encourages in fact the whole family to come for these programs 
um, so that it's the older generation and the younger generation yeah. that are together. And that makes a huge difference then. Yeah, very much so. Very Thank much. you. I want to just add one more. I just want to yeah. add one more point to this. I think these are super important points that you know we learn mm -hmm. from uh, you know institutions like ISB, FPN, and you know exposing with other families how they have dealt with issues. But added to that, I see as families are becoming more nuclear, or you are living separately. Uh, I think the importance of formal communication and formal platforms is also very important. Uh, you know, what we have found is earlier, if you're living in the same house, you know, you eat together, you play together, you know, you see each other more often. But once you start living in separate houses, you know, without knowing, you know, gradually bonds, um, you know, get diluted. So one thing which has benefited us is that, you know, we have a, just like our board meeting, uh, which is quarterly, we have a formal family council meeting every month with a proper agenda, proper minutes. And uh, between my brother and I, uh, we have an informal meeting every week. Uh, so, you know, just it's an update meeting, it's a catch-up meeting and, um, uh, you know, I think uh, those things have helped us, uh, us tremendously. And added to this, we have created a, a council of advisors also, uh, where in fact it was advisors, advised by John Ward and he said that, you know, you must have some, you know, wise people with whom you can interact and, uh, you know, and they, they told us to do a project on family history. We were saying, why do we need to do this? It was a joint family earlier, now it's just two of us. But when we did that project, we interacted with the extended family and learned so much, you know, so sometimes, you know, just doing, you know, just ensuring that you have a formal structure uh, to guide you on the family side. And it just goes back to the same issue of creating pride, same issue of, you know, learning history, uh, learning from history. So uh, these two things in addition to what Farhad and Meher said, formal communication and having a council of advisors has been helpful to us. I think wonderful. These are very, very practical insights. So I'm mindful about the clock. So therefore, I would go into the last part of this uh, panel discussion. One very critical question, which is a favorite question of Professor Ram and many of us actually, thinks about that uh, moving from uh, what we realize that or we have seen in, around the world, that business families are generally driven by the intrinsic motivation of sustaining the family legacy, by preserving and enhancing the family identity and growth, growing social emotional wealth, as we call it in academic context. So successful, long-lasting business families across continents have demonstrated that it is possible only when the family and the family business is built as an institutions. So all three of you have actually experienced that in some way in your own context and also as Parad is mentioning, been interacting with uh, many uh, practitioners, uh, family leaders, and the scholars in this field, including uh, Professor John Ward. So, what do you think your advice would be for the many of the family businesses who are as yet to to even start the journey of making the as a family as an institution in the in the emerging world? If we have to continue to family businesses to dominate. Uh, and and uh, because India's position is going to be also bigger and better. So what would be your advice? And this is a question to all three of you because you have something complimentary to add to each other. Should I go ahead? Yes, yes Farad, you can start. Okay, go ahead, I, I, okay. I'll give it very short. I think my, my advice would be... Uh, you know, always remember that the institution is bigger than you and focus on your duties as opposed to your rights. Um, Wonderful. Uh, for, for me, I think uh, a, a few things. One is, uh, I think, understanding the purpose for which you exist. Uh, why are we doing what we are doing? Uh, what are we here for? So really sort of spending time to understand the purpose, because unless we really understand that, it's not going to be an institution that um, survives over generations. The second, I would say, is um, this whole long-term thinking rather than short-term profits, you know, uh, constantly looking at the top line and bottom line sh short-term. 
the third, uh, which Farad has spoken about, is a very strong set of values. Um, I think values is what really sustains you generation after generation. Um, and the fourth, I would say, is governance. Um, so putting together, you know, whether it's a, a board structure or the right person as the CEO or whichever governance structures. Um, but I would say, unless we get all these right, um, I'm not sure whether, and of course, last but not least is, is the whole family fabric. Uh, but as, as Puneet rightly said, the institution is larger than any individual. So as long as we understand that, um, I think family businesses can go on generation to generation. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Puneet, your thoughts? Uh, uh, no, Farad. Yeah. Farad. Yeah, sorry, yeah, Puneet, yeah. Sure. Farad. Sorry. Sure. Farad. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I would just reiterate what I said earlier and what Mayor just re re uh, mentioned uh, on values. I think the values really is really what you've got to share the values. And you've got to you've got to have common values. There must be commonality in that, and, and a good appreciation for that. Uh, second is of course the governance, and the governance both from the company governance, that means the family business governance, but also the family governance. So, uh, if it's a small family, just the ability to be able to communicate, uh, to understand, uh, understand what the aspirations and dreams are of each of the family members and find a way to satisfy those dreams and ambitions as well. Um, and the third thing I think, uh, when you're working together, is also the ability to compromise when needed. I think there is a need for that in a family business. And I'll just give you an example. You know, we uh, took a group of our Indian family business uh, members to Japan uh, two years ago. And we had the chance to meet with some wonderful Japanese families. We met with one family, which was 12 generations. And you know what the family business was? It was the Japanese tea ceremony. So this family had that pride and legacy of the Japanese tea ceremony for 12 generations. They started way back in the 17th century, in 1600 and something. We met another family, which was 18th generation, and they started as a sweet shop in Kyoto, and they still make Japanese sweets even today. And then the third family was a 30th generation family, and that family is Kikoman soya sauce. You know, it's well-known brand all over the world, but it's 30th generation. Uh, and we met the 30th generation member. And I asked him, I said, what really uh, has been the one thing which has preserved this institution? And he said, it's family harmony. If you, uh, he's asked if that one word is family harmony. Oh, so thank you, Farad. And uh, it's, we can go on like this. There are so many uh, pieces of wisdom and insights. But uh, every good thing has an end. So I know Professor Rab is eagerly waiting that I now hand it over to him to do the final closing comments and vote of thanks by Professor Ram. But thank you very much, Farad, Meher, and Puneet for a wonderful set of uh, comments and insights. I thoroughly enjoyed it being uh, moderating the panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Over to you, Professor Ram. Thank you, Saugada. Thank you, Parad, Mahar, and uh, Puneet for this uh, really, really insightful uh, conversation. And uh, I mean, I was looking at the chat box for the questions and uh, for too many. And uh, Saugada has been blending many of them with uh, his own conversational uh, points. Um, and I, I, I have <laughs> written down several points. For me, as a student of family business, it's a continual journey. Every time I listen to uh, experts, it's a, a lot of new insights. And um, I mean, I have been listening, I've been interacting with uh, 
all Farad, uh, Nehar and the Puneed all these years. And uh, it has been really, really wonderful every time. Okay. So the, I, mean, I was trying to think about some good way of saying what is the sum and substance of the message. There are various points. I, I, I thought that one basic point is that don't take the family for granted. Don't assume things. Act. Start act early and be proactive about that. Okay. So it may be structured approach, it may be governance, it may be grooming, variety of things. Okay. So typically, families have a tendency to postpone and assume things. But that's not the right thing. And that's what is one of the basic things. And I won't try to summarize uh, the points. There are far too many points. Um, and I, I would like to thank, uh, again, Nahar, uh, Farad, and uh, Puneet for uh, obliging us, for joining our conversation. And your, your passion is reflected in terms of your commitment and your positive response. Every time I ask you for your time, every other time I ask you for joining the conference or talking or anything, you have never said no. I've always found time for that. That's the kind of support, that kind of commitment that has enabled us to make this journey so far. And we look forward to continuing uh, this conversation, this relationship. I would also like to thank all the participants, all the people who joined this, this uh, discussion, this session, uh, and stayed on. Uh, Finally, I would like to uh, tell you all that a link to the uh, Lasting Legacies book will be available at the uh, ISB centers, the Thomas Milani centers uh, website soon. So if you would like to see the book, please see that. We will have a printed version of it coming uh, in the near future, but because of the pandemic, we could not uh, uh, decide when to do that, but we will do that sometime in the near future. So thank you again for joining and uh, wish you all the very best. And the future of family business is very, very promising, as our experts said. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Ram. Thank, thank you and congratulations. congratulations, Ram. All, all the best, best to you. Bye. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye.